I have come to realize that most parents put a lot of energy and spend a lot of time with thoughts about their kids. You could say they worry about their kids. Some will say, well, we don't worry. We're just very concerned. Others say we focus on them. Just to make it easier, we'll just say they worry. They worry that the kids will be healthy, that the kids will be kept safe. It's, that's especially true when they first leave to go to a preschool or kindergarten. Parents are concerned that their kids will be treated fairly and justly, that the kids will have an opportunity to develop their skills and their talents, to live their dreams. But if we really talk to the parents, there are other things that they want. And chief among all of those is they want their sons and daughters to live well. They want their kids to have upstanding lives, to be moral, to be authentic, to have a spirit of integrity. That is not true just for parents about their kids. It's true for all of us. It's true for priests, pastors. We want people not just to come to church. We want people to live moral and upstanding lives. We want it for our friends as well. We want it for our siblings. And it's not new. It was part of the question in the gospel reading today. How does one live a good, holy life? And we have a classic case of an incident that took place where Jesus made a teaching out of it. And the incident was that the, the Pharisees and the scribes observed the followers of Jesus, the disciples, not washing their hands. Now, in the 21st century, we talk about washing our hands all the time. You have to remember in the first century, it had nothing to do with germs, certainly had nothing to do with the virus. They simply didn't know that. It was all about some sort of ritual purification. And that's when Jesus, he's kind of fed up to hear with these hypocritical statements. And he says, the prophet Isaiah, in the Old Testament, you guys know Isaiah, of course. The prophet Isaiah says, you guys give me lip service, but your heart is far from me. And so Jesus goes on to say, I want people with integrity of heart. I want their core to be focused on what is good, and then the good will flow from there. So on Tuesday morning of this week, in our weekly Bible study, I asked the question, how does one come up with a, a pure heart? Now let me talk, tell you about this Tuesday morning Bible study. It was 16 weeks ago next week, I'm sorry, 16 years ago next week, right after we founded the parish, that I said, let's have a Tuesday morning Bible study. And I think the first week we had three or four people. Now it's about 25 or 30, and they come every Tuesday after the 9 o'clock Mass. We, we meet for about an hour with coffee and baked goods. Actually, I suspect they come because we have coffee and baked goods. And then we have the scriptures of the coming Sunday. So the group was meeting this past Tuesday, and I said, how does one have a pure heart? Because if Jesus says, purify your heart, let all the good flow from that. How do we have a pure heart? And several members of the group proposed what they thought a pure heart would be and where it comes from. But for me, it's become sort of the, the meditation of the week. How do we transform our hearts so that they are pure and strong enough that good things will come from it? And I've come up with a, a few insights. And the first one is we have to seek it. We have to desire to have a pure heart. We have to intentionally and conscientiously and consciously seek to have a pure heart. It's not sort of like, well, I'd like to be good. It's like we have to stand before the Lord and say, transform me, transform us, transform my heart. We have to ask for the grace, the grace that does change things, and the grace to accept that grace when it comes. That's the first thing. We have to consciously seek it. The second thing, though, is we have to know that it doesn't just stay there. We don't just want to have a heart that says, oh, I feel good about people. I've got a, a warm uh, feeling about everybody. That's going to be good enough. Not necessarily, because what's inside has to come out. If you notice the second reading today, the letter of James, he says, don't delude yourselves and just think that 
it's all about words and not actions. Actions count. Our behavior makes a difference. How we interact with other people. And James even goes on to say, a, really, a real Christian is one who takes care of those in, in need. He uses the example of widows and orphans. And of course, we know what widows and orphans are, literally. But in those days, widows and orphans were totally at the mercy of everybody else. There was no social security net. It just didn't exist. But when he says that, he also means all people in need. All of those who are struggling and those on the fringe and those who are feeling isolated and abandoned. He said, that's the real test. We'll call it justice. That's the real test of living your faith. The heart has to be like the, the physical heart. If you look at the physical heart, it pumps blood to all parts of the, the body. The heart of faith has to activate all parts of our being so that we respond fully and completely. And we don't just do something that's pious and uh, in church only. It has to be lived every day. In addition to asking for a pure heart, and in addition to trying to let that heart affect our behavior, there's a third thing, and the third thing is really perhaps the greatest focus today. The third thing is we have to surround ourselves with other people of good faith. In other words, we are all influenced by others. We want to be clear that we're influenced by good people. I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but uh, if somebody good is around us or several good people or a, a whole group called a church and we actually interact, it's going to be easier for us to remain faithful to the call that we have. If we try to isolate ourselves, we're going to be in trouble. And certainly, if we put ourselves in harm's way, we're going to stumble. I remember a school teacher, a very good teacher, told me um, about a class one particular year. And she had been teaching for many years, and I saw her that year around Christmas time. I think it was fourth grade that she taught. Uh, around Christmas time, she said, I have the best class I've ever had. They are responsive. They, they like each other. They help each other out. They're learning things. And I feel joy every time I go into the classroom. That was around Christmas time. I saw her again around, it was after Easter, so maybe let's say April or May. And she brought it up and she said, remember I told you how much I liked my class? And I said, yes. She said, guess what? A kid moved into the school system and was put in her class in January. And she said, the whole class changed. It wasn't just that this one child had difficulty responding or behaving himself, but he brought the worst out of everybody else. By the way, I was using that example at the last Mass. There were several elementary teachers here. And I, as I was preaching, they're all nodding their heads. And after Mass, a couple of them even came up and told me, it's amazing what, that, what can happen with one other person. But that's not just for kids. That happens with adults. We are influenced by people around us. Sometimes we think, oh, we're, we, can, we can withstand any storm. Morally speaking, I'm not so sure. And it's not just people. It's even what we indulge our free time in, whether it's entertainment or internet or, or what we read. We have to be careful. We are not invincible. There's a lot of poison out there, and it's going to affect us. We have to seek out the good, and the good will keep us going. We are called to be authentic, holy people. Jesus makes it really clear. It's what's from the inside that makes a difference on the outside. Today, we emphasize the, the help we need from the Lord to make the inside truly pure. 